Hi everyone, Dr. Mincer here, Greenhouse Integrative Medicine. So, let's talk about marijuana. Marijuana. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you say the word, that oh-so-illegal word? Probably images of people toking and getting high. Well, that's thanks to our friend, the THC molecule, which is best known for its psychoactive effects. However, out of 85 or more individual cannabinoids, which are the chemical components found in marijuana, only this one produces powerful, intoxicating psychoactive effects. The other 84 or more that have been proven... <laughs> that was my kid. The other 85 or 84 or more that have been proven to have many beneficial effects without getting us high have pretty much been ignored by those of us here in America. The growers over the last decades have actually intentionally bred out the weak THC and high in other cannabinoids plants and supplied us with the mostly high in THC and very little other beneficial cannabinoids. Surprisingly enough, the big pharmas have sort of done the same. They produced pure synthetic THC, many of you may already know of Marinol, Syndros, and Sazamet, that are FDA approved for the use of chemotherapy induced intractable nausea and vomiting and as an appetite, appetite stimulant for those with AIDS-induced anorexia. And even more surprising, the latest research is showing that there, those other cannabinoids actually help to attenuate or decrease the negative unwanted side effects of the THC, such as the unwanted paranoia and psychosis. So, now a little on THC and then to follow I will detail some of the other cannabinoids. Excuse me one second. Can you wait a second? Yes. Thank you. So, receptors for THC, also known as endocannabinoid receptors, are found in the hippocampus, which forms the memories, the cerebellum, which forms movements, and the frontal cortex of your brain, where we think, essentially, where all of our uh, cognitive processing happens. So, these receptors typically bind to chemical components called anandamide, which our brains make naturally. However, there are a few key differences between THC and anandamide. For example, THC lasts a lot longer than our natural endocannabinoids do, and anandamide actually begins to break down in a matter of minutes, and after binding to a cell, its effects are pretty short-lived. It seems to live long enough to tag a cell and say, boom, you're activated, and then quickly disappear. So, THC's half-life can actually last several days in frequent users. This is a huge difference. And this binding of anandamide influences similar functions of THC, such as it's an appetite uh, stimulant, it alters your pain perception, and it alters your uh, ability to uh, remember things, and makes you more forgetful. In fact, forgetting can actually be thought of as an act of survival. Forgetting well is just about as important as remembering well. This fact is particularly interesting when you think about the potential treatments for those with past trauma or those with a PTSD diagnosis where remembering all too well actually causes this intense suffering and pain. Soldiers who are returning from areas of intense war and destruction could possibly actually benefit from being taught how to unlearn and forget some of what they previously learned that's causing them pain and suffering. So THC also has antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, anti-seizure, neuroprotective effects. However, there are also other cannabinoids within the marijuana plant that have these same effects to an even stronger extent without being psychoactive. So you might be wondering, hmm, if THC fits so well into these receptors, then humans must be made to consume cannabis, right? Not so fast. THC just happens to tap into a system already present in the body, and high doses of THC over time has been shown to cause psychosis in many individuals. So I think the takeaway point from the scientific data that's been gathered so far is that the beneficial effects of THC specifically need to be weighed against the detrimental effects before considering this component as a part of your medical marijuana regimen. I also highly recommend trying to stay away from the use of THC in children unless their medical condition absolutely warrants it, which some do, and even then, it's very much advised to start with very low doses. Just to follow up, THCA, you might hear of it because it's one of the chemical components that the Department of Health is going to be testing for, just stands for THC acid. All it is is the acid form of the THC. It's the naturally occurring form of cannabinoids. The difference is really just a carboxyl group. So THCA is the naturally occurring form and it's heated. When it's heated, it bumps off the carboxyl group to become THC. And that THC then binds to our endocannabinoid receptors in the brain. So that's it on THC. Stay tuned for more videos. Sorry about the interruptions. That's what happens when you have a six-year-old. Have a good night.